On this mission, we will learn the characteristics and how to employ the RWR, the radar, and the defensive countermeasures of the F-4B, Phantom. Mission set on the Marianas map, on June 1975. The mission includes the following sections. Review of the Phantom's RWR, radar controls, radar modes, and defensive countermeasures. For this mission, we have enabled the altitude hold autopilot, and have placed the aircraft in active pause to be able to better explain the RWR and radar. The F-4B is a design that predates the advent of the surface-to-air missiles, so at first it had no radar warning devices, nor countermeasures to defeat SAMs. The Vietnam War prompted the development of radar warning receivers, and countermeasures defensive devices, so from 1970 the F-4B was retrofitted with the AN, APR, 25, first-generation RWR. As simulated for DCS, the RWR behaves like a much more modern unit, since it can detect all radar types available on the sim, and assign an ID code to each contact, while the real APR-25 could only display direction and distinguished amongst a few radar types only by means of an oral frequency. At the moment, the highlighted RWR display is off. To activate it, you need to bind the toggle RWR on-off command, either to a key combination or to a HOTAS button. If you have not already done so, press Escape and select Adjust Controls to bind this command. Next, turn on the RWR, the display should illuminate. The RWR display depicts a top-down representation of the airspace around you, with your aircraft represented by the center of the display. The 12 o'clock position represents the nose of our aircraft, while 6 o'clock being our tail's direction, and 3 and 9 o'clock being towards our right or left. Radar receptors located on both sides of the fuselage's nose and tail, allow the system to roughly determine the bearing of any radar signal received by our aircraft. Please note that the system is passive and thus can't determine a contact's range. The three concentric display circles are for reference only, and represent the signal strength of each contact, the weaker signals being depicted on the outer ring while the strongest signals will be closer to center. We have enabled a SAM-2 missile battery on the island ahead of us. Our RWR represents it using an identification code. On this case, the ID-19125 corresponds to the search radar of the SAM-2. Now, the tracking radar of the SAM battery has detected us and its ID-75 has appeared on the RWR display. The rhombus identifies it as a tracking radar and our RWR alerts you with an audio beep. If the SAM battery fires upon us, its radar symbol will begin flashing, and the beep will change onto a high-pitched sound to alert you. Press spacebar once you hear this high-pitched sound. You should be able to see the missile's white trail going up, from the island to the left of our nose. On a real combat mission you would now initiate an evasive maneuver to avoid the SAM, by turning away from it and at the same time descend towards the ground or sea. As we are out of the range of the SAM-2, there is no need to take evasive action. The SAM battery will keep firing upon us, so you may still hear the tone and see its tracking radar symbol on the RWR display. Press spacebar to remove the SAM battery and continue the training. Now we have enabled a KJ-2000, an airborne early warning aircraft, somewhere towards our front light. The ID for this contact is 2000, and it has a tilde over it to denote that it is an airborne radar. This aircraft is unarmed, and its radar will not generate audio warnings. Note that the RWR is not able to distinguish friend from foe, 
representing all contacts in the same way and color. Press spacebar to remove it, and generate instead a hostile fighter. OK, this time we have generated a fighter contact. Its radar ID is 11, which corresponds to a Chinese J-11, externally similar to a Sukhoi-27 but with a different radar. Note that we have only been able to detect it on the RWR because this fighter has its radar active, otherwise we would not detect it. Let's confirm this, press spacebar, and we will command it to turn its radar off. You can see that after a few seconds the RWR contact disappears from the scope, but the aircraft is still on flight, which you can confirm by cycling the aircraft view with F2. While having its radar off will prevent the fighter from launching long-range radar guided missiles, it could still use infrared missiles when it's shorter range. Press spacebar to remove the fighter and finish this RWR section of the training. The F-4B uses the AN, APQ-72 radar, which is a tracking unit designed to be used alongside the AIM-7, Sparrow air-to-air -air missile, the first beyond visual range capable missile available to the US. The Sparrow requires the target to be locked by the launching aircraft during the whole of the missile's flight, forcing it to keep pointing towards the enemy aircraft until a hit occurs, or the missile would lose guidance. As simulated for DCS, the radar's operation has been simplified quite a bit. For one, it is operated by the pilot, while on the real Phantom it was operated by the radar intercept officer, on the back seat. Second, the real radar displayed the target using a boresight perspective, while on DCS it uses an easier to visualize top-down view. At the moment, the highlighted radar display is off. To activate it, you need to bind the toggle radar on-off command, either to a key combination or to a HOTAS button. If you have not already done so, press escape and select adjust controls to bind this command. Next, turn on the radar, its display should show its basic symbology. The radar display depicts a top-down representation of the radar scan cone in front of the aircraft. The highlighted vertical bar represents the nose of our aircraft, while the 12 o'clock position on the scope corresponds to our current aircraft heading. The highlighted numbers marks a reference of 45 degrees to the left and right of our heading, and help to orient our aircraft towards any radar contact that we may detect. On the same way, these highlighted numbers mark a reference of 15 degrees to the left and right of our heading. The radar display has four range scales, 10, 20, 40 or 80 nautical miles. Currently, the scope display is set to 10 nautical miles. You select the desired range with the predicted target range decrease and increase control bindings. Using the right control plus equals keys, increase the scan range to 80 nautical miles, to give us the training capability of highlighting some of the display elements. Good, please leave the scan range at 80 while I explain the scope elements. I have highlighted the target designator cursor, which is a pilot movable radar symbol, that will allow you to point to contacts that the radar has detected. You move the TDC using the target designator bindings shown on the figure. Try it now and move the TDC around to get comfortable with its control bindings. The TDC has three small numbers that surround it. They provide the following information. The number at the bottom left of the TDC, represents the display scan range, currently 80 nautical miles. The number at the top left, indicates the current distance in nautical miles between the cursor and the nose of our aircraft. Move the TDC and observe how this number increases as you get farther away from the bar representing our aircraft. The number to the right of the TDC represents the current antenna elevation, in degrees. Elevation means that the radar antenna can be tilted upwards or downwards, in order to detect aircrafts that are higher or lower than our own. You select the desired antenna elevation with the scan zone up, and scan zone down control bindings. Note that you can tilt the radar antenna not only up and down, within limits, but also it seems to be able to tilt left and right, but this lateral movement is not yet implemented. Use the scan zone up, and down, bindings and observe how the elevation value varies. 
the maximum tilt up is plus 20 degrees, while the maximum downward tilt is minus 38 degrees. Please, after testing this control, leave it as close to zero as possible, to not impact the remaining radar examples. Any radar contact is shown as a small square, I've currently generated an aircraft in front of us so that you can observe how it is displayed by the radar. The range at which the radar can detect a target depends on several factors, the size of the target aircraft, and whether the target is coming towards us or retreating from us, are the main factors. Also, note that using a radar is like employing a flashlight on a dark room, you only actually see what is being illuminated by the light beam, the rest of the room can easily have a danger in store for us. To illustrate this point, I have generated a second aircraft, but this time it is flying much higher than us. This means that it will not be seen by our current radar beam. You will need to tilt the radar antenna up, do it now. Press spacebar, once the second contact appears on the scope. Good, our radar is now able to detect the high-flying aircraft. However, it is possible that with the antenna tilted up, we may lose contact with the first aircraft. As a last example, we have generated a third aircraft, this time flying much lower than us. It will not be seen by our current radar beam. You will need to tilt the radar antenna down, do it now. Press spacebar, once this third contact appears on the scope. Good, our radar is now able to detect the low-flying aircraft. As before, it is possible that with the antenna tilted down, we may lose contact with the other two aircrafts. Please, after detecting this third aircraft, leave the antenna elevation as close to zero as possible, to not impact the remaining radar examples. As simulated for DCS, the radar has two modes, search mode, and single target track mode, STT. The default mode we have seen so far is search, where the radar simultaneously displays all contacts that it detects. Firing a sparrow requires the radar to focus on a single target, and for this it uses STT mode. I have enabled a few targets ahead of you, to demonstrate that our current search mode can display several contacts at once. Move the target designation cursor over the closest target that you can see, placing the contact square in between the two vertical bars of the TDC. Then use the target lock control binding. If the target is at a close enough range, it will be locked and the radar will go on to STT mode. If it doesn't lock, keep trying until a lock is achieved. Good, you are now on STT mode, where the cross displays the locked targets and all other targets have disappeared from the radar screen. The number besides the cross corresponds to the target's range from us. You no longer have a TDC cursor, as the radar is locked onto this single target. On a real combat you would now turn your aircraft, to place the cross in front of you, and then fire a sparrow at it, but make sure it is an actual enemy as the F-4 radar can't distinguish friend from foe. To exit STT mode and return to search, simply press the target lock binding again. Do it now. Good, the radar is now back on search mode. Press spacebar to finish this section of the training. Originally, the real Phantom was not equipped with any missile countermeasures devices, as none existed at the time the aircraft was designed. But during the Vietnam War, the Navy began losing aircrafts to SAMs and radar-guided AAA. It became obvious that Navy pilots needed some way to detect and counter these radar threats. A crash program was instituted on 1967 to develop ECM and ECCM gear for Navy aircraft. A place had to be found in each aircraft to put all this electronic gear which was never anticipated when the aircraft were designed and built. The gear had to be shoehorned into each aircraft in every little nook and cranny available. Hence the program was named Project Shoehorn.
Under this project, many F-4B were fitted with the AN, ALE-29, flare and chaff countermeasures dispenser, mounted on the aft end of the engine bulge of each engine. Each unit held 30 cartridges of either flares, chaff, or a combination, contained in a plastic bucket which was loaded into the dispenser. Its operation panel was mounted on the Rio's cockpit, on the back. For DCS, the mod has a simplified countermeasure system, and the ALE-29 programming panel is not visible, as only the pilot cockpit has been implemented. As simulated, the VSN F-4B carries by default 48 flares and 48 chaff, while the real aircraft actually could only carry 60 in total, 30 on each fuselage side. Also, on DCS the packs are grouped in groups of 24, while the real aircraft had groups of 10. There are three bindings, for releasing a single flare, a single chaff pack, or a single combo of one flare plus one chaff. There are no programming capabilities yet, for a sequence of countermeasures. Let's try these bindings, change to external view with F2, and zoom out a bit. Now use the three bindings to check their operation. Press F1 to return to the cockpit. Congratulations, this concludes the training syllabus for this mission, you have successfully finished this training mission. Please exit the training by pressing spacebar.